Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Big Ten, your daily podcast on the Big Ten Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Big Ten, everything you need to know about the Big Ten Conference every single day. I'm Nate Dickinson, your host, alongside our new Wednesday co-host, Asher Lowe of Locked On Badgers. And we're also joined by his co-host over at the Badgers show, Ben Kenny, with us as well. Guys, thank you for joining us here. We're going to get to what you're here to talk about, Wisconsin football, later on in the program. As we're starting our team previews, as we get ready for Big Ten football, we'll take a deeper look into Graham Mertz and the Badgers. What can this team do to try to get back to Indy and hopefully over that hump over Ohio State, which of course is no small task in its own. But guys, before we get to anything else going on up there in Madison, we want to start the show today by talking about the biggest news of the day. The AP Coaches Poll is out. The minds of college football telling us what they think about where the teams stand right now. And I want to start with your Badgers because while I was not surprised by any of the teams that showed up in this top 25 out of the Big Ten, I was surprised that after Ohio State, we didn't see another Big Ten squad until all the way at number 15 where your Badgers clock in. So how are you feeling right now in that 15 spot, still number two in the Big Ten as far as ranked teams go? Yeah, you know, I... I think that with Iowa at 18, it, it was a clear one-two in the coaches' poll in the Big Ten West of Wisconsin and Iowa. They're clearly setting the table. And and by the way, no other team. I, I think was Minnesota receiving votes, Ben. I, I I'm trying to remember if, if someone else was receiving votes, but I don't think anybody else. And Nate, Nate, you would know. Uh, so I I don't think anybody else was was even receiving votes as long as I remember from that uh, in the Big Ten West. That is, of course, the Big Ten. Yeah, there's East, no right? Minnesota. Yeah, so it's a clear one too, right? I, I mean, nobody else is even close to these top twenty-five rankings in the coaches' poll. It's that clear one too, and a fifteen versus eighteen is actually closer than I think I thought Wisconsin would be to Iowa. And uh, three, I mean, three slots different, essentially ranked at the same spot to begin the year, right in that middle of the table. And I think it's always interesting to look relative to other teams in your division in your conference. And that's kind of how I view the coaches' poll more so than right, right, like comparing a Wisconsin and uh, an LSU or a Wisconsin and a Bama to start the year. It doesn't really do anything for me. I don't really care. But Wisconsin and Iowa, that is the matchup that probably will decide the Badger future this year. And it's interesting to see them play so close together and nobody else even in their vicinity because I actually thought Minnesota would would possibly at least be receiving votes, if not close to the, to the end of this top 25. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my first thought, honestly, was that I hate polls and polls are stupid and they shouldn't exist. Um, and the coaches poll doesn't have as much as an impact as the AP poll obviously does, which we'll see next week. So that's always my first thought when I see things like this, because honestly, Wisconsin is ranked near the same range every single year. And then we have the same discussion as like, are they just going to be the same old Wisconsin or can they take that step forward? And honestly, looking at the more I look at college football this year, the more I look at the Badgers the more I think that they're underrated at 15 and especially given Notre Dame up at seven. So Wisconsin will play Notre Dame uh, in September up at Soldier Field and the line out, Wisconsin's already three and a half, three point favorites. So that's an eight spot difference in a coach's poll. And part of that obviously is because Notre Dame was in the college football playoff last year, but still I, I think 15 is too low for Wisconsin. I see them closer to 11, 12, or even 10 and, and, and inside that range. Well, thanks, Ben. And I do want to pick your guys' brains more about just exactly how good this Wisconsin team can be in a minute. But if we're not doing polls, what are we doing then, man? It's like, I get it. The polls don't mean anything, but like, we got to talk about something every day, right? I just don't, it's, it feels like it's something that people hate on just to hate on it. Well, no, the, the problem is at least the AP poll, it means too much. Like the, they do the preseason poll, they do the polls throughout non-conference schedule, which often doesn't really matter when you have Alabama and the SEC playing the Citadel in week three. But that poll then goes on to have way too much of an impact on who makes the playoff and who is seen as the best teams at the end. Because going into the season, we don't know how like the, the year is going to shake out. And those preseason rankings just end up weighing way too much because the people that vote in it just use their confirmation bias throughout the year to confirm what they 
thought that they knew entering the season. So it's not that I, I don't like, like I love polls. I love talking about them. It's just stupid how much they matter. I think you see even worse misses been in college basketball in the polling area. Like I think you see even more ridiculous preseason rankings in college basketball with certain teams being as high as they are and then falling off. And then they don't want to take them out. Like they'll go like two and three to start the year or something. And they're still like 24 because they started the year at six or seven. If a team plays a really tough non-conference schedule or one of those early preseason tournaments. So I agree. And by the way, Nate, you asked, is there an alternative? I think there is. And I think Ben even mentioned it in his Notre Dame spiel right there. I'd rather talk about Vegas lines. They're not mutually exclusive. You can talk about both. No, no rule against that. But personally, I think that is a more interesting indicator of what a game will look like, where a team is supposed to be heading into a year, whether it be over under win totals, um, whether it be uh, a spread on a game like that Notre Dame game. Like I'm more interested in the fact that Wisconsin's minus three than the fact that they're eight slots below the Fighting Irish. All right, well, we're getting a little too big picture here. Let's stay close <laughs> to the poll on things. As we continue to look down, the, the only other surprise, I guess, people might see as they look down here, a bunch of classic college football names, then Indiana clocks in at 17, above Iowa, above Penn State. I, I mean, the Hoosiers are legit. We know that. But yesterday we learned that the coaches think that this team is actually that top 25 talented. I thought that was something the Hoosiers might have to earn at the start of the season at the very least. But no, they put themselves firmly in that top 25 to start off. What do you think about what the coaches think about the Hoosiers so far? And does it change what you think about them at all? So Asher's gotten mad at me. I, I love Indiana entering this year, and he's gotten mad at, at how much I do. Because I, I love how their team, they obviously bring back Penix, a uh, healthy at quarterback. And I think he is that number one QB in the Big Ten. But they bring back Miles Marshall, Fry Fogel at wide receiver, and their defense is still loaded. Micah McFadden with some of the secondary guys, Taiwan Mullen, we saw last year. The thing about Indiana over the last couple of years is we've just seen a consistent progression. We've, we've seen a consistent rise with how they play, uh, with their results on the field, and just with the mantras surrounding the program. Like, even though they lost Iowa State and they were down big, made that comeback, like, that was a more competitive game. Uh, we've seen between those two teams in a while. So I like them being in the top 25. I, I like them at 17 as the clear number two team in the Big Ten East. Yeah, yeah it would be really, really like, fun. Competitive, I get annoyed, Ben, that Ohio State-Indiana game. Every time we yeah. – you, you know you're always like, that was such a close game. And it wasn't. It wasn't that close of a game, but well, certainly, what – Yes, than, than, than any other Indiana team I can remember, like in the last – Decade of my I life. mean, Indiana was able to drop a bucket on one of the best secondaries and defenses in the country. So, yes, once they were already down a billion. I mean, it's it's a matter of just like how much do you put the weight on? Oh, you tried really hard against Ohio State because I mean that's all anybody really does if you're not one of those top schools out there. So, I mean, like putting up a good fight against the Buckeyes is all you really have. So, if you think that's enough to get you ready for this season, then. Okay, but I mean, it, there's other things Indiana fans have to point toward the big win against Penn State, of course, but it's not like Indiana has any sort of huge thing to prove that it has arrived, arrived yet, I don't think. I feel like that still has to come, but this is like the coaches saying that they have what it takes to be able to do it. And speaking of coaches, if I'm looking at something on this Indiana team that makes me confident for the future, that makes me confident they can contend, in the Big Ten East, it is the coach. It is Tom Allen, who is a guy that every time we watched him interact with players after games, during games, uh, just brings, yes, like commands respect, but brings such a positive, fun vibe while commanding that respect. And I think it's a really cool balance. Uh, there's another coach in the Big Ten who will remain nameless as I talk about him anonymously that I think brings a lot of that crazy vibe, but doesn't necessarily command the respect that maybe – a Tom Allen does while also being a full-on players coach. And I think I think Tom Allen really combines uh, two important sides of coaching college football and meshes them together well, and I think we saw the benefits of that this past year. Yeah, a certain coach that wears his loafers without socks. Like, that that's inexcusable. Anonymous, anonymous. <laughs> well, guys, I'm sure you guys have plenty more <laughs> thoughts for us to get into as we try to break down more this Wisconsin football team. We'll try to keep things in house here, not try to reach out to anyone or take anybody, take shots on anybody too early here in the show. But 
I, I want to ask before we get into our first break here and we get into the Wisconsin team. Uh, I took a look here and I have my thoughts on it, but I want to ask from both of you, and we'll start with Asher first, then go to Ben, I suppose. What do you think is the make or break thing for this Wisconsin squad to be whatever you think is successful this season? And we'll get to what your definition of successful is as well later too. The easy answer is Mertz, but I think the correct answer is also on the offensive side of the ball, and I think it's the running game because I think that was one of the issues for Mertz last year, and we've talked about that, Ben, leading up to this season on Locked on Badgers, but I think not having a traditional Wisconsin running game uh, really hurt Graham Mertz in his first starts as a collegiate quarterback. And, yes, against Illinois, he came out guns blazing, but when Wisconsin played much better defenses than that Illinois defense, that run game was the issue because the Badgers need and have needed that for uh, as long as they've been a successful football program. That's been the staple offensively. And also this running back room, well talented, hasn't necessarily proven themselves to the lengths that other Badger rooms have heading into a year. Although with that being said, I think that the one-two punch of Jalen Berger coming back and probably leading the way as a sophomore and then the transfer and Chesma Lucy uh, and then you can also make Clemson transfer, that is, and mix in whether it be Braylon Allen, uh, whether it be Julius Davis, Isaac Garunda, whoever gets those other kind of third reps, uh, mix those guys in. And there's a bunch of other guys I haven't even named. I mean, this all of a sudden there's like 12, 15 running backs on the roster because of that the freshman class. But I think they have the opportunity to return to where Wisconsin needs to be in the run game. And I think that'll be the make or break thing this year. That yeah, I, I – I wish I could disagree and, and give you another position group, but uh, that's the one to me. Last year when they won football games, you're talking the blowout against Illinois, the Michigan game where they ran down their throats, Minnesota, and then the bowl game, they ran for an average of 205 yards, 4.43 yards per carry. And that's still honestly lower than what we're used to seeing from you know those best Wisconsin offenses. But in their losses against Iowa, Indiana, and Northwestern, 110 yards per game on the ground, only three yards per carry. And that had the snowball effect of putting all the pressure on Graham Mertz, who was throwing to pretty much nobody at wide receiver because everybody was hurt. And the offense just never was able to gain a rhythm. And even further than that, the defense had to bail the offense out throughout the game because offense couldn't move the sticks. They couldn't flip the field. So it's the run game that is, A, going to ease Graham Mertz into finding that rhythm and finding that confidence and letting him go ball out to the weapons that are now back. But it also, it's just a full team wide philosophy thing. Like, you know, Wisconsin, like they are the school that runs the football when they're not able to the rest of the dominoes kind of fall. Yeah. I think you guys set the framework pretty well. Wisconsin this year, a team with that defense that has all sorts of talent to it as a traditional Wisconsin team does, but an offense with talent, but unproven talent at the moment. And we'll dive more into all of that in just a moment here on Locked On Big Ten. Alongside Asher Lowe, our new co our new Wednesday co-host, and Ben Kenny, his co-host over at Locked On Badgers. I'm Nate Dickinson. We'll be back to talk Wisconsin football in just a moment. Hey, Nate Dickinson here with Locked On Big Ten. BetOnline.ag is the place to go for any of your online sportsbook needs. The baseball season is back underway. The NBA Finals are wrapping up. And of course, I know you're already looking at some of those football futures for the fall as well. Whatever your need may be, as far as sports betting goes, betonline.ag can help you make your money. Head on over to betonline.ag right now for all the best lines, all the news you need to make sure you're up to date before you put those bets in, and we'll get you some free money to start out with too. If you go to betonline.ag right now and use our promo code LOCKED ON, you'll get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's 50% on top of whatever you put into your account that first time you put money in, just add it on for free. Thanks to the people over at Bet Online. It's betonline.ag, your online sportsbook experts. Back in on Locked On Big Ten, everything you need to know about the Big Ten Conference every single day. Here in a crossover episode with Locked On Badgers, we've got the co-hosts of the show, Asher Lowe, who will be in with us on every Wednesday going forward, and Ben Kenny joining us to talk about Wisconsin football and preview this team going into this season. Wisconsin a squad with, as it always has, big expectations here to succeed in the Big Ten and put themselves on a national stage. It's been a struggle for that team to get over that Ohio State hump, just as it has been for everybody else in this conference in the last half a decade. But 
Right now, the Wisconsin team has a solid defense coming in, but an offense that still needs to prove itself and had the 12th most offensive yards in the Big Ten last season. And I'll start there, guys. We talked about it a bit going into this segment, but why was that offense so uncharacteristically unproductive? Because that Wisconsin team, usually in that running game, if, even if it's not great, you rely on it to be able to be consistent enough to not end up near the bottom of the conference in offense. I think availability uh, is everything for college football teams uh, in football in general. Like you just have to have guys healthy to succeed. And Wisconsin simply didn't have that last year at almost any time, whether it be because of COVID protocols, whether it be because of actual injuries Wisconsin was down two or three wide receivers in essentially every game after the first couple of weeks. Graham Mertz also, after the year, we learned, had an injury he was dealing with after the Michigan game beyond uh, that Michigan game going into the rest of the year, and he still started uh, the rest of the year. So had an injury he was dealing with, but Kendrick Pryor, Danny Davis, uh, rarely on the field. We had that Northwestern game where it, all of a sudden, 30 minutes before kickoff, Kendrick Pryor and Danny Davis were announced out, uh, which was Wisconsin. That's, that's their – there are two big wide receivers last year in terms of experience and other guys had to step in with less experience, whether it be Jamari DK, who was essentially the one in that game against Northwestern and had actually uh, a huge touchdown catch for Graham Mertz. But that was really the only big play Wisconsin's offense made all game in that one and in that loss. And then, of course, the uh, the issues at running back that we've already talked about. I think the issue going into the year was no clear number one and Nakia Watson couldn't really seize that role. Jalen Berger looked like that guy heading into the back half of the year. And I think that Michigan game that Ben was talking about earlier where Wisconsin did run the ball well, that was Jalen Berger's kind of coming out party to say, okay, this guy, this guy can be uh, a three down back in college and be a really good one at that. That was kind of our first glimpse of it. And I think heading into this year, we know that he'll at least be the one a, if not just the straight up number one for Wisconsin in that room. So availability and uncertainty in terms of the depth chart and also of course, dealing with, with an injury to Graham Mertz that we didn't really know about all year. No idea how much that really impacted him, but you certainly saw a very different Mertz for a variety of reasons from week one into later in the year. Yeah. So I mean, in addition to that, that was the biggest part was the injuries and the team getting COVID and all the adversity they had to deal with, with playing and then stopping playing and then coming back to play. Two other reasons to me, number one is it goes with the avail availability but they lost Jack Cohn at, at entering the season. And, and, and you could laugh at, at the fact that I just support Cohn no matter what. But they had a guy, Graham Mertz, that was thrust in there. He only had about 18 days to prepare for the season when Cohn went down. So it, it's hard to put a new inexperienced quarterback in an adversity-filled setting like that and have him and the entire unit succeed. So that was a big part of it. But also they got dominated in the trenches when they went to Iowa, when they played Northwestern and when they played Indiana, like they were, they were getting beat up front, which was pretty surprising because you don't normally see uh, Wisconsin get beat up front like that on either side of the football defense or offense. And then the turnovers, it was more just a, the entire unit from offensive line to wide receivers to quarterback. There were just inconsistencies everywhere and, and even there were some games where they could move the ball. They just couldn't score. It was just a, a different thing every day that all culminated in a, a unit that really screwed the defense, for lack of a better term, in some of those losses. I, I want to go back to just a couple of the things you guys both mentioned about just the injuries, but also the COVID protocols, because there's been all sorts of talk about how that affected last season. Wisconsin is a team that can point to that as to a reason for its struggles. That other team that you guys don't like to mention over the border in Minnesota, another team that has a fan base that's trying to pin a lot of those struggles from last season on the COVID thing. And, and I'm wondering, because with Minnesota, there's a lot of people who are saying like, oh, the Gophers would have been the same team as it was in 2019, if not for that squad. But they forget that Which, that that's, defense that's, also yeah, that's a little seven far. new players. It, the defense was also starting seven new players on Minnesota too. Is this the thing with Wisconsin where like how much of this do you guys think is whatever happened last year with the inconveniences and how much of this is actual needing to board up the ship? So I, I mean, I think that's the biggest question for almost every program entering the year. And that like is goes into my argument with Sean Clifford and Petrus and quarterbacks 
because you wonder how much of 2020 is the norm and how much it was just adversity. For Wisconsin, I credit so much of their struggle to just the year and the entire situation because they play great. The team gets COVID, they take two weeks off, and then you just have a rotating cast of characters that they were missing. They have a new inexperienced quarterback coming in. It was the entire year of adversity. But when you add all that together, I think that made it nearly impossible for them to succeed. So I, I chalk up a lot of their inconsistencies and struggles to that and just the entire timeline of the year. Yeah, it was a ridiculous timeline. When you look at the breakdown of how it went, you play week one and you play, not only play, you play the best football game I think I've seen Wisconsin play maybe since I've been here. Uh, like, like a perfect football game. Yes, against Illinois, sure. But Graham Mertz had Patrick Mahomes tweeting about him. Like it was crazy. You don't see that from Wisconsin quarterback. Man, the electricity was nuts in week one. Then all of a sudden, all this electricity, you're at the top of the top and you have a two-week break. And not just a break. This is not just a game break. This is a practice break. Uh, this is a being around each other in the facility break it could, because it was COVID-related. Uh, guys had to go to hotel rooms to quarantine in Madison. I mean, like it was – they were just in hotel rooms for like a week straight, just, just staying in a hotel room. That was it. And that was, that was all they could do. And it's pretty hard to play a football game a couple weeks later when you've done that uh, for a week of your prep. But, hey, Wisconsin looked great in that football game too against a Michigan team that had – their own issues, and I think helped Wisconsin a lot in that game early. If you go back, Michigan kind of settled the Badgers in with some very, very poor Joe Milton mistakes and uh, turnovers that really weren't necessarily forced, more uh, just bad, bad Michigan mistakes that they had quite a bit of at that position, at the quarterback position all year. But then you fast forward a little bit to that Northwestern game, and 30 minutes, like I was saying, literally 30 minutes before kick, none of us knew this was coming. Your two wide receivers for Graham Mertz are out in Kendrick Pryor and Danny Davis. And your one is a guy that has played in, what, one and a half college games, Ben, at this point, and not even played a ton in them. So uh, it, the Michigan game, he played a bit, but, like, this is essentially his second real college game. And, and, and the guy is your one. And that is really hard to do against Northwestern defense, by the way, that had first-round talent that year. So I don't know how you can't look past – the COVID situation. And then when you lose one game in the way Wisconsin lost that game, where it was just the defense was as good as they've been all year. Uh, again, uh, they, they were pretty much great the first half of the year in every game. And you just simply can't score a point, no points in the second through fourth quarters. The only points Wisconsin scored was a long touchdown pass to DK in the first. It was brutal to watch. You're just waiting for that one drive, waiting for that one drive. And it never came. I mean, it's not that I put everything on the pandemic. It's just in the back of my head, I got that thought. Like, I want Wisconsin to be that team that's playing near-perfect offensive games with Graham Mertz. I want Minnesota to be the team that can knock off Penn State. I want Indiana and Northwestern to be as good as they played when it was in the middle of a pandemic and everyone was dealing with everything. But it just feels like the smarter side of my brain is saying something's going to have to give here, and one of these teams is going to have to have been a fraud. I don't know who it is. I don't think it's Wisconsin. But I just have to wonder with all the ups and downs, who is going to be that team that breaks out and proves that 2020 was a fluke? Who's going to be the team that says, oh, well, maybe we overperformed a little bit and took advantage of those COVID disadvantages. That's just stuff that floats around my head throughout. But again, going a little bit off track, let's get back to Wisconsin and talk more about Graham Mertz. This is a guy who had immense talent. We know, as we mentioned, coming in highly recruited going into college, played in that one game. But again, the it, Injury, health issues, things with him have been things that put question marks over your head now. Maybe that has partly just to do because he's playing quarterback at running back you, and those kind of questions are going to surround him. But where are you right now on just your confidence level in Graham Mertz to be among the top in the Big Ten? Because I think people know he's good. The question is whether or not he can take Wisconsin to great. Yeah, I'm cautiously confident that he could be one of the best quarterbacks in the conference because like we've mentioned, you think about last year, he has 18 days to prepare for the season. He hasn't really played in college uh, at all before that. Then you go throughout the year, you pretty much lose all your weapons. You're having to run to the sideline to get the plays before every single play you run. There's no consistent force behind you to help you out. And then you also play through a shoulder injury. So you, you factor all those things in and it makes sense why he struggled. 
And you, you did see at the end of the season, the Duke's Mayo Bowl against Wake Forest. He finally got it back on track, didn't turn the ball over, played solid football. Not the great football we're expecting from him, but solid. So you like you see those trends, and now you get the full offseason to prepare with everybody. All your weapons are back. I think everything around him is now set up for him to succeed after everything kind of set up for him to fail last year. Mm-hmm. Through two games, Nate, Graham Mertz had thrown seven touchdowns and no picks. And then it was in that <laughs> Michigan game at some point that he suffered that shoulder injury, as far as we know. And we didn't really know anything about it at the time. That was more a postseason thing. But – it, it sort of speaks for itself. And like I said, there are other reasons for the struggles in the next three games against Northwestern, Indiana, and Iowa. I think all three of those are a step up defensively from what he faced, obviously, in the first two weeks. Also, of course, Northwestern in that game, you're, you're talking about no wide receivers, essentially. And, and same for that Indiana game. So it, 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 was, it was tough to adjust, especially with an injury, without your wide receivers, to playing all of a sudden some of the best defenses, not in the Big Ten, in the country. Like Northwestern and Indiana were up there with the best defenses in the country last year. Iowa was really good defensively last year. And uh, I think that adjustment w- was difficult and came at the wrong time. He, you know, there were plays though that, and, and Ben's clipped some of these on Twitter uh, when, when he was doing uh, some game logs of Graham after games, there were some plays, Ben, and I think you'd agree in the last say four weeks that he just has to make, like there were, there were just some throws that he has to make, like he can, he can be a little hurt. He can have no receivers, and he has to make that play, uh, especially in the red zone. That, that was to me where it really stuck out. In the red zone, there were some some just really easy throws that weren't executed, and I think yeah, and, there that this year. And some of that was even just mental. Like there was, he wasn't even waiting for a guy to break open. He would take his easy check down. But but I think all of the the hardships he went through kind of led up to that, where he isn't confident. But now with all everything set up for him to do well, then the confidence will just build. Hmm. Well, I guess we've danced around it, guys. I'll ask bluntly, if Graham Mertz is what we assume Graham Mertz is, how much better is this offense going to be just because of how much better the pieces around him are going to be? He'll have receivers. He has a good returning core of linemen. He has talented running backs to work with. Well, this offense can be great. It really can be. Uh, and, And I think it starts, like I said, with the running backs. But I think a name that we haven't somehow even mentioned yet is Jake Ferguson, who could be right. one of the most prolific weapons in this conference in the country in the red zone and help Graham a lot as that security blanket of the tight end position. And uh, even though his, his grandfather isn't the AD anymore, I think that he'll, he'll carry on the Alvarez legacy well this year and be Graham Mertz's go-to guy, even with Kendrick Pryor and Danny Davis both returning. And I also think you'll see one of the young receivers possibly step up, whether it be Devin Chandler a little bit more who came on at the end of the year, whether it be Chimere DK, uh, who, who, like I said, was just thrust into that number one role. And maybe that helps him this year, right? Maybe the reps he had last year helps him this year. And all of a sudden Wisconsin's COVID issues last season turned into a blessing in disguise uh, for a big 2021 year. So I think that it, they have the potential to be phenomenal. And I think Jake Ferguson is the guy that can get Graham Mertz to that next level. And with that, I completely agree. This this has the chance to be an explosive offense, which you're not really used to saying about Wisconsin. But the offensive line is also lining up to be really good. So you look through every aspect of the unit and Paul Chris returning to play calling, which I love. And and it all points to a much more prolific season. I don't want to say how explosive they'll be, but it'll be an offense that is much improved definitely from last year. And in my eyes, definitely the best in the West and one of the best in the conference. Hey, Nate Dickinson here with Locked On Big Ten, here to tell you a little bit more about Built Bar, helping you get the show here today. Built Bar is the place to go for all of your protein needs. They have more than 15 grams of protein per bar with less than five net grams of carbs and five grams of sugars as well. It's all the healthy stuff you want without any of that unwanted filler, but great flavor too. Built Bar has 100% chocolate in every single bar, and these things taste outstanding. People are loving the new Grasshopper flavor. It's supposed to be a little bit of a play on the Mint Brownie Girl Scout cookies that people like so much. So you can go and try that or any other flavor out right now at BuiltBar.com and save some money by using our promo code LOCKED15. That's LOCKED15 for 15% off your first order at BuiltBar.com. Built Bar, the official 
pro team bar of the U.S. track and field team. So you know these guys are legit. That's Built Bar helping you get the show here today. And we thank you, Built Bar. Well, guys, and again, Asher Lowe and Ben Kenny of Locked On Badgers joining us here on Locked On Big Ten to talk Wisconsin football as we get ready for the season. The discussion so far has been mostly offense because that's where a lot of these question marks are. The defense on this Wisconsin team is really, really solid right now. I want to ask you guys, just where do you feel like there are any cracks in this defense at the moment? And also, at the same time, just because we don't want to talk only negatives, where is this team going to be the most threatening on that side of the ball, too? So definitely the biggest defensive question mark is at defensive end because the team loses both of their starters from last year in Isaiah Loudermilk and Garrett Rand. So you have Matt Henningsen and probably Isaiah Mullins stepping into those roles. Henningsen has a lot of experience, but he suffered an injury, missed most of last season. I, I think it was the Michigan game where he went down. So that's where the question mark is, just because that's where you have the least experience returning. You look across the rest of the defense, they have a great nose tackle in Keanu Benton, who I think is set to break out this year. They have arguably the best inside linebacking core in the country with Leo Chanel and Jack Sanborn. The outside linebackers at Wisconsin, they're always productive and they always seem to be good. They have a rising star there in, in Nick Herbig. And then you go to the secondary, experienced guys in Caesar Williams and Fayon Hicks and Scott Nelson and Colin Wilder back at safety. So that, like, it's really the entire unit from last year, minus Eric Burrell and those two defensive ends. So if those defensive ends can do their job, then it should be last year's unit, but even better. And if you're looking at anybody, I think you mentioned it, Ben, that that's a huge loss outside of the defensive ends. It is Eric Perrell, who was not only a uh, starting safety for Wisconsin for multiple years, but also I think a vocal leader on that defense, kind of an emotional leader on that defense, a guy that had everybody in the right spot and a, a guy that leaves a position to fill for Colin Wilder to step up uh, as a starting safety for Scott Nelson to have a big year, two years off his injury where we saw those flashes as a freshman. He had that devastating injury in week one, and, and this can kind of be his full circle, I think, come back here. The, the, the position is set up for him to do really well, but that would be a position I'm watching early in the year just because Colin Wilder and Scott Nelson are guys that I don't think have been asked to do as much as they'll be asked to do this year without Burrell. Well, guys, as we wrap up the conversation here, I, I want to ask first, is there anything we're missing here as far as just talking about Wisconsin's Offense, defense, things going on within the team. I guess coaching staff, you mentioned Paul Chris taking back on play calling. That's a big deal. Is there any of that behind the scenes stuff that we're missing as far as the Badgers go as we get ready for 2021? Or just stuff you feel like people aren't talking about, that people should be talking about more, even if we have covered it? Yeah, one big positive and one big negative for me, aside from offensive defense. When you look at special teams for the for the school, Punter Andy Vujnovic is an absolute beast, and he's exactly who they need, weapon kicking the ball, especially when you get into those Iowa contests where the punters play a big role. He's awesome. Was there that is a question where he was doing the thing with the – I don't even know what it was called. Yes, was yeah, him? yeah, right. yeah. Some, he, he some type of Scottish – yeah, Scottish yeah. – I, I don't know. I don't lift. I, um, I, yeah, I was going to say, like, I was trying to figure out how to describe it over the podcast. He lifted – he had a barbell know, and he just held it over his head uh, for a while. Was wild, but I don't know what he's he crazy. Was. It was yeah, awesome. he's an animal. But my question comes in the kicking game because you have Colin Larsh and Jack Van Dyke. One of them great at long kicks. One of them more accurate in the short kicking game. So do you go to a two kicker rotation, have one guy do the longer field goals, one guy do the chip shots? That's a question mark we have because there isn't that set really solid kicker on this team. And we know in the Big Ten kickers matter. So that's where I would have a big question about the team aside from defensive end. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And we've seen, by the way, Ben, in our time at Wisconsin over the last four years, we've seen the kicking game be Ugh. quite a problem. In fact, if I can think about every single major loss Wisconsin's had, kicking had pretty much something to do with it, whether it be an upset loss. It was on my birthday. Had, any game, essentially any game, I feel like Wisconsin <laughs> should have won if they didn't. Kicking was probably the main or at least final reason. I should say. Yeah, and if Anthony Lottie can hold on to those punts, the Badgers beat Ohio State and they beat Oregon in 2019. So there you go. I'm not just, play, I'm not just talking about field goal kicking. It's yeah. all oh. type of kicking the football. For real. Well, you guys like to take those shots at Minnesota. I will mention first team all preseason Big Ten, Kent State transfer Matthew Trickett of the Minnesota Gophers, one team that has had plenty of kicking woes. Maybe, maybe 
being a little bit better this season. We'll see about that. But anywho. Yeah, they should make championship rings for getting a preseason <laughs> All-Big Ten guy. <laughs> anywho, as we move on to Wisconsin, guys, uh, it's looking at this season, obviously big expectations. The goal every year is to be able to get to that championship game and then beat Ohio State in that championship game. Uh, I don't know. Is there any sort of twist that you guys put on it for this year's edition of that? You know, I think the schedule is good enough where if Wisconsin wins out, there's – Ben, I, this is a tough one for me, Ben. If Wisconsin wins out – Do you okay, want me to say it? it I'll say a, it. has a very, very close game against a great Ohio State team. Like Ohio State would have to be really great all year and loses, say, a one-possession game versus Ohio State. I'll, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be making the argument. What we'll Asher is argument. trying to say is that there it's is a – We'll be making the argument. There is, an, a, there, is a, there is multiple scenarios out there, put it that way, for this team to get into the playoff. Uh, their <laughs> schedule lines up well. They get Michigan and Penn State as crossovers with the East, but they both play them at home. There really isn't any big-time road tests until they go to Minnesota, but by that point, I think the Gophers' defense will be dead. So, like, they should be able to win the West handily, barring any significant upset. Then you get to that point, you go to the Big Ten Championship, there is a path for them to make the playoff even with a loss in that game. I'm not going to say they'll do it, but there is a real likelihood. I just think at this point, people are severely underrating this Wisconsin team, partly because of last year, partly because of the mantra around the program. Like the more I look into it, the more I talk myself into this team being the team to beat in the West, obviously, but having a real shot at beating Ohio State. It's there. The path is there to get an at-large bid to the college football playoff, but I think it involves... You're not a believer. I I think it involves just a few more SEC schools losing two games than you guys want to think about right now at at the moment, really. But we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Guys, again, Asher Lowe here and Ben Kenny of Locked On Badgers. They're talking Wisconsin every single weekday, and we'll have Asher on here every single Wednesday to talk Big Ten, and I'm sure he'll squeeze in as much of his Wisconsin stuff as he can when he's on with us in the future. Thanks, Asher and Ben, for joining us here on the program today. Before we let you guys go, again, where can people see your stuff? And, of course, remind them how to get to the show as well. I am on Twitter at Ben Z Kenny, uh, K-E-N-N-E-Y. There's a second E. I produce the Bill Michaels show here in Madison. So for any football fans that I are also Packers fans, that's mostly what we talk about. That's a great place to come do that. And we're both writers uh, up at the Badgers Wire at USA Today. So all on Twitter at Ben Z Kenny. And the show account for Locked on Badgers is at Locked on Badgers. Yeah, at A-O-W underscore 33 on Twitter. And most of the stuff Ben said, minus the Bill Michaels show, is also where you can find me, Badgers Wire, Locked on Badgers, of course. And uh, if you like NBA stuff, any NBA content uh, that I write for USA Today, I also usually throw up on Twitter. So you can check that stuff out as well. I know Asher got his blue check mark already. Do you have yours, Ben? I do not. And no, I, I'm still waiting to. I, I'm starting just to embrace the fact that I probably won't get it. I have not. I really, really want it still. No shame. No shame at yeah. all here. <laughs> I mean, it's a crazy life, really. I just—I don't know. I, I'm anti-establishment. <laughs> I, person. I I got I got invited into these back rooms in Las Vegas. Now that I, I'm here for the week, like it was shut it was up. <laughs> Asher's a big fan of the establishment, is what he's trying to say. I prefer to be more anti-establishment and not catering, you know, to the big fish in the I pond. Mean, uh, but but he can go do whatever he wants. I can't do the. Pie I want it. Though. I want it. I want it bad. Go ahead and be your anti-establishment peasant. I don't want to, to be a part of your club. Right now, man. I can't believe you just live in this establishment. All right, never mind. <laughs> All right, guys. Asher, we'll talk to you again soon. Ben, we're going to have to get you on, obviously, soon again as well to go back and forth with Asher and I too. It's been a good preview of Wisconsin football here, guys. And of course, as the season gets started up and Wisconsin starts making some noise, I'm sure we'll hear from you again. Thanks again for coming on. And we'll talk to you again soon here on Locked On Big Ten.